everybody. I'm Harlan Cohen, and this is Before College TV. Today, we have a career conversation with four graduates from Roosevelt University in Chicago. We have just an unbelievable group of, of individuals who are bringing so much to our conversation today. I know you're going to enjoy this. We have Ellie Derrick DePaula. We have Irene Gaglos, Jordan Fierce, Grant Polachek. Welcome, everybody. I'm so grateful to have you here. Thank you for being here. It's Thank wonderful. You. It's wonderful to have the chance to visit with you. I am so curious to know about all of you, to learn about you. And I, I always like to start by understanding your dreams. You know, like, what's your dream? Because I don't think we ever stop dreaming. Have any of you stopped dreaming yet? No? Okay, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad. Well, people don't think that adults, you know, and I think we're all adults here, you know, like still dream. And I think there's something really powerful about that as we continue on our journeys, that, that we have that, the ability to do that. Irene, you're coming to us from New York today, right? Yeah, this is true. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. You're, you're not from Brooklyn, right? I am not from Brooklyn. I'm from Des Plaines, Illinois, which is a Northwest suburb of Chicago. Right. So somehow you ended up in Brooklyn. We're going to learn yeah. how you got there. <laughs> it's probably pursuing your passion or, or you know, f- fulfilling a dream. What's your dream right now, Irene? I think for me, um, this idea of dreaming, especially as an adult, has definitely shifted um, as time has progressed. I think my dream, to be honest, is to really instill just like a positive energy for those around me. Like I really hope to make a positive change both on a small level and on a large scale level. And that includes, you know, really just connecting with my values and who I am. And hopefully by um, embodying this, it can help create or even dare I say, instill some sort of passion in others as well. Yeah. It's nice of you to do this. I mean, you know, putting yourself out there is, uh, is vulnerable, you know, mm-hmm. as like people judge us. Yeah. Uh, I'm judging what a buzzword. Vernal, yeah. Vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like we're all being judged right now. Like I'm judging mm-hmm. you, you're judging <laughs> Ellie Dare, Jordan, Grant, mm-hmm. you're judging me. But I mean, I think that some people get scared about that. Like, Ooh, what are people going to think? Mm-hmm. And do I have to think one thing or another? Are you okay with people not always liking you and what you're putting out there, Irene? It's a hit or miss sometimes. I think we all um, maybe can agree. I don't want to put this on y'all, but vulnerability is kind of hard. You know, you're putting yourself out there in hopes that people will accept your authentic you. And sometimes when they don't, it it hurts. But, you know, you got to, I think, realize that not everyone is meant to be in your life for long term. And I think with that mindset, I'm able to just be who I am. And if those who want to stay in my life stay and those who don't, that's okay too. You know, we're all on our own individual journeys. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to get so deep so quick, no. but like, you know, I thrive like, for this. Don't even I know. Worry. Like we're diving deep. Well, you're also a graduate. You're a graduate of the Chicago school of professional psychology, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like you dig this stuff, like this is, this is yeah. your jam, right? It's my element. Yeah. I went and I pursued my master's in industrial and organizational psychology, um, which is the study of behavior in the, in the workplace. So it kind of meshes psychology, learning about the human uh, brain, what motivates us and bringing that into the workplace. So yeah, I, I, I literally eat this for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I, I love it. Okay, cool. Well, we'll we're going to learn more about that. Ellie Dare, I know you are an artist. You are a, a concert pianist, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Hey, yes. I want to ask, I got to ask you this because you're in front of big groups and you have to hit the wrong note sometimes or oh, forget absolutely. the music. Like, That's has there been a the time game. where you've messed up? Oh, a lot of times. It's not like one time. Like there was a lot of times. And I think that's the beauty of it. I mean, uh, that's the difference between being a, an artist, a human being and a machine. There are plenty of softwares out there that can play all the music that is compiled ever. Uh, but I think that the vulnerability, we talk about vulnerability of going on stage and, and giving your best, even though there are some mistakes, it's part of, it's part of the art. It becomes your signature. You know, not, I'm not praising the mistakes, but I'm saying that it's absolutely allowed. And I, I teach my students that mistakes are not a sin. You, know? you can be at the top of your game. You can be someone who is, you know, you, you, it, it probably doesn't get any higher in terms of, you know, being a concert pianist and just like a major league baseball player, you will have errors. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's bound to happen. Sometimes, I mean, uh, Irene could talk more in detail about like the nuances of it, but the, the psychology of like being under pressure or the emotional control that you have to have uh, in order to be in front of, of an audience. I mean, it's just a few of us here and I think we're all like a little bit nervous, right? But I imagine when you go on stage and you have like 200 people, everyone watching you, waiting, expecting for something to happen. Some of them are expecting to happen, like good stuff to happen. Some of them are just like waiting for something bad to happen. Yeah. And you got to deal with it. You know, you have that in the back of your head, in the back of your mind that is always like triggering it. So it's challenging, but it's a, it's a, it's a process. What's your advice for a young musician or an artist who is worried about messing up during a live performance? I think it's interesting because I try different approaches. One approach that is that I found that was very successful is when you get so immersed in the in the music that you're making uh, that you forget where you're at. Mm -hmm. So I just like focus in the music and try to understand the context or like understand the uh, you know the environment of the music the musical environment that I'm providing more than the people in the audience. You know, the relationship happens like sometimes or at the end of the performance, but it's such an intimate moment. And I, when I enjoy just that part with myself, I think is a lot more successful than just like getting worried about people. And I teach master class sometimes and I tell students, like some students that perform for the first time in front of an audience. And I, I ask them, you've practiced this so many times by yourself. And you're never mistaken it, correct? You got 100%, 120%. But you go on, when you go on stage, it drops to 70%. And when you're performing, your ears are paying attention to what you're playing as well as to every single detail. There's a fly over there, you hear it. There's someone breathing heavily, you hear it. And it's absolutely incredible because your concentration is so dense. It's so like, it's so there. So it, it, it is tricky. And I think learning how to control yourself, not only the coordination, Part of it, but like the, the, the emotional aspect is, I think, is, is should be one of folks focus. I love that idea of focusing on the art and really getting lost in the message. Because I try to do that as a speaker, where once I focus on the message and the meaning, what happens next is going to be something that I have no control over. But all I can do is just be very passionate about what I'm offering and then putting that out into the universe. And it yeah. seems, I had seems a, similar. I had a, 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 a mentor, a professor that I performed one piece once. And after the, the recital, I stood up and I smiled to the audience. And after backstage, he came back to me and was like, why did you smile? It was like, because uh, I, I was pleased with what I've done. I mean, it's like, there was nothing about happiness in that song. Why did you smile? That didn't, that didn't fit. And like, that tells me that you're not hundred percent inside of the music. You know, you're not immersed in that. It was like, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so I think it was very interesting how like different perspective change, you know, from the audience, from the stage as well. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. Was that a Roosevelt teacher? He was a former uh, uh, student at Roosevelt. So I studied with Gabriel Dobner, uh, who studied with Dr. Lazar. And I studied with both of them. So Dobner was my uh, professor during my master's and Dr. Lazar was my artist diploma here at Roosevelt. Okay. I didn't ask you your dream. Um, Ellie Dare, what's your dream? My dream, oh, when I was younger, my dream was to become a paleontologist. But I think it changed. I think both of you and Irene like touched on that, that like our dreams always change. Uh, so I wanted to be a paleontologist and my father was just like, you crazy. <laughs> and then I started, you know, piano and I got involved in that. And my dream became, you know, uh, turned to be, I want to be a concert pianist. And later on, when I was in that path, it switched to creating something that would expand musical experience. Uh, from educational perspective, from entertainment perspective. And so my dream, I've been on that path right now, that like fulfilling that dream of sharing what's to make music with others. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. Jordan, it's wonderful to meet you. I know that you're in an exciting, you're in an exciting place in your life and we're going to learn about that. But I would love to know right now, today, where you are as a grad student. And how many years are you in your grad program right now? 
Um, I'm actually just weeks. So I'm in my second week of grad school. <laughs> okay. So that's a lot of change. Yes. Yeah. So you're in this grad school program and I would love to know, you know, what's your dream and, and you know what, you can have two dreams, so you don't have to like pick one. So, you know, you could spill both those. Yeah. I think, um, if you would have asked me this question, you know, a year ago, my dream professionally was to be a political speech writer. Um, if you're asked, if you're to ask me this question today, like you are, I think more broadly, my dream is to just pursue what brings me the most joy, um, and to bring joy to others. And so that's really my dream. And uh, I'm actually a grad assistant at Lewis university on their women's basketball team. So really just love to work with, um, those young players that are still in their formative years, getting to know um, themselves and playing the sport of basketball through college. And that's really my dream right now is to just bring them joy and to help them navigate um, those few years of their undergrad that they have. How did you end up working with the basketball program? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Actually, um, I spent the last year, I graduated in 2020 from Roosevelt and then spent the last year living with my parents um, due to COVID. And so it did a lot of different jobs. And then really, um, I had a job working with the COVID vaccine and national outreach for that. Um, that ended in July and I knew this past July um, and I knew I wanted to move out of my parents' house. I was tired of, of living under their roof, feeling like I was back in high school and, and things like that. And so I um, wanted to find something where I wouldn't be working remotely like I had the last year. Um, and so came across the job on Twitter of all places, applied for it, um, and they got back to me within a few weeks and, and really went through the interview process. Wait, so I want to just be clear. You found a job on Twitter? I did. Yes. <laughs> you please explain how that works for anybody who has an interest that doesn't really quite believe it or understand that you can find a job that way. Yeah. I mean, I came off um, the 2020 campaign and really that's where a lot of folks are posting jobs and, and tweeting about openings that they have um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so really uh, making sure that I was networking with folks that were posting job opportunities was huge. Um, the Lewis one, I also coached high school basketball and so had a contact that um, had sent me the tweet in my DMs and really saw the opening. And then really, like I said, went through the application process after that. How many interviews did it take? Um, it took two or three. And how badly did you want the job? I wanted it really badly. Like I said, I wanted to, I wanted something new, wanted to get out of my parents' house and really wanted to shift away from politics. And so this just seemed like the, the opening for me. So are you scared that you're not going to find the perfect job, the perfect career, the perfect life? Yeah, I, I think I definitely am scared. I think I really am in some transformative years of my life um, right now. Like I said earlier, at a crossroads of figuring out what I want to do. So definitely fearful for that the time to come where I maybe don't know what I want to do or I don't have an idea of what's to come. And so I, I do feel some of that fear right now. Oh, can I alleviate some of it? Yes, I would love it. <laughs> oh, I said that. It was kind of a softball question because... I, I wasn't ex entirely sure, and you know, you're in a new place, but just the fact that you are willing to experience, you know, what's coming your way, and to allow yourself to feel it, and to surround yourself with people who do things that you know, create joy in your life, um, you know, you're going to be you're going to be amazing. You know, I, I have I have no, I have no doubt that you will you will be able to find that because you know, you know I think this part of your life, and you all, I'm a little bit older. Um, but I think you all may be able to contribute. I, I think your, your twenties are really about doing exactly what you want to do and, um, figuring it out. So, you know, congratulations. Cause I think you're just kicking ass doing it. Thank so, you. <laughs> it's brave. I don't know if, if anyone else has any thoughts on that. Grant, what about you? What do you think of what, about what Jordan just said? I think it's awesome. I found in my life that, um, just just take one step at a time i ended up my journey has been been you know it doesn't even make sense i've taught karate for a living i've uh, worked at a nonprofit. i've uh, been at a star i mean it's just just one thing my my degree doesn't match with what i'm doing now so you know stay positive stay focused do something you like and, and i think it all all rolls out in the long run yeah well that's exciting and uh, I, I really believe that. Grant, so give us a little sense of what your dream is. Uh, currently, I have two real focuses. Um, I've had the uh, 
good luck of, of joining this, this tech startup uh, has really great leadership. We're growing really well and I'm, I'm focusing my energy on you know, making that a, a, a good place to, to work for, for my team um, and, and growing that, that business. Uh, we're, we're in a really interesting space that probably most people haven't heard of. We're, we're helping people name their businesses. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun to you know, not know. There's very few companies who have done this, so we don't have a lot of models or anything like that. So it's fun to, to look out and um, really be able to, to create something different. So my, my dream there is to help, help that business keep growing. And uh, I also have these two wonderful children, four and seven, and I'm really focused on, on helping them uh, you know, be happy and fulfilled and, and live, live the life that, that they're going to be excited about. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. I want to know more, uh, Grant, as long as we're talking, why don't you give me a sense of how you landed at Roosevelt, just kind of a little bit of a, of your background real briefly, just so we can have some context and, yeah. and, and how you, how you chose Roosevelt, why that was a good fit for you. I um, talk about this a lot, but I had a good amount of struggle in college. Um, I went to several different places. Um, the first place I went wasn't, wasn't a good fit for me. So uh, and I found myself not knowing what to do when I, when I ended up in that, I was there for I think two years, a year and a half or two years. And it just, um, <clears throat> just, just wasn't where I, I needed to be. Uh, so I needed to step back and that's when um, I transitioned over to a community college and uh, got my degree, um, degree from, from Harper. And then I was looking at you know, what's the, the next right thing. And, and, chose Roosevelt because it, uh, you know, has a great program. I think location was, was really important. I actually went to the Schomburg campus, um, which, which I think a lot, a lot of people go to Chicago and some of the other places, but the location was really, really important to me. Um, and I, I got a good feel when I went there, there was good teachers, um, good community, a lot of good resources. So all those things, things played a part. What was your major? Um, education. And why did you choose education? I thought I wanted to be a teacher until I spent a good amount of time in the classroom and realized, um, going back to kind of what we were talking about with Jordan is, you know, you you struggle through it and you you trip a couple of times and that wasn't where I, I wanted to be. Um, my mom was a teacher and it worked out for her and I you know, liked a lot of the, the things about teaching, but you know, just didn't didn't resonate. Is it okay to change your mind, to change jobs, to change paths? I think it's fun. It's not only okay, it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think a lot of people are, are concerned when it comes to like applying for jobs, does my degree fit with what, you know, where I want to go and really trying to mold your life. And, and I had a lot of fear about that, but never, never really came up much. I mean, people want you to have some relevant experience, but, but that never held me back. And I think that in the education degree, I mean, it really, it really gives you a wide range of, of skills. Um, Absolutely. You're able to use that transfer to lots of other professional, Every, you know, yeah. uh, situations. Every day. Yeah. Especially sales. If you can educate, you can sell things which has been that. an interesting, there's lots of ways of selling things. Um, there's a really good book called the challenger method. And I haven't read in a while, but basically it's different approaches. You know, you can become somebody's friend or you can, um, you know, make a ton of cold calls and hope that, that something clicks. And, and the challenger method is about education. So if you can, if you really understand your product and you really understand how to explain it to somebody, you know, you're, 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 up in front of somebody like you're teaching them here's step one and here's step two and here's step three and then they start going oh i get it and and if i get step four then i can start using it and here's how i'm going to use it uh, so when you can take them through that education process they you know you have a good vision and then then people naturally want to want to buy something instead of trying to convince them that it's a good idea i love that the idea of of an education degree you used it also to teach karate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and also within the startup, teaching other people how to do certain yeah. things. So yeah, totally. It's, it's, it's great. I think a lot of people worry about their degree and is it going to be a perfect fit and how is this going to help me? And it's fun to 
to learn about this because I think also the education that you get uh, at, you know, for all of you at Roosevelt, it's something that you're able to then transfer into so many different areas as you explore what really speaks to you. So Jordan, is this reassuring? Yes, it definitely is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's all true, which is, which is really cool too. It's just, it's just doing and experiencing and trusting and, and uh, the more you trust and do, uh, you know, you'll, 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 you'll land on your feet. It, it always works out, right, Jordan? I hope so. Has it worked out for you so far? Um, no, no, that's definitely not the case. Um, no, I, no, I'm actually someone who has a different degree path. Like I have my degree in political science and sustainability, um, and, and I'm now coaching basketball. And so, um, some of the things that people are saying are definitely resonating with me. Well, I mean, I it just- worked out. It, 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 yeah, maybe we just yeah. need to be the ones to tell you it is, but that political science degree, I mean, you're dealing with how you work through conflict and how you manage adversity and how you deal with change. And there's no better example of that than, than sports, you know, and, and the game and the journey of every, of every experience and teaching those players uh, and, and using those skills is something that I think will really come in handy. It'll be interesting to see. We'll have to do this again in like five years with you. Okay. And you'll come back as, as like a five year, five, five years later, Irene, I would love to get to know you a little bit better. Tell me a little bit about your journey. I know you're now in Brooklyn. Yeah. You started in, in displays and, uh, you know, how did you, how did you get here? What was the path? I started my journey actually not too far from displays. I started at a community college and that's why I got my associate's degree but I joined so many organizations. So I was part of a lot of different um, organizations on campus and I did a lot of event planning. So to me, I thought, great, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. Let me go ahead and get my bachelor's in this, get my education in event planning and hospitality. So I, full transparency, I only applied to Roosevelt University. Um, I was like, okay, this seems like a a good school to go to. Unfortunately, I, I did end up getting in and I uh, received my bachelor's in hospitality and tourism management. And then I thought, okay, I will move to Vegas because that is the hospitality capital of the States, potentially the world. But, you know, if I don't make it there, my life is hopeless in hospitality. So I generally thought that um, that was a real um, thought in my head. And I moved to Vegas um, relatively young, though in the moment I felt like I was this like, yeah, I'm 23. I know so much about life, but you do know, you know, some, but, um, Vegas definitely helped expedite my experience in the hospitality world. And I think it helped me realize that I have so much respect for those who work in the industry. I think they work tireless, tirelessly, but it's not for me long-term. I didn't see it as like a long-term career objective, Um, so I moved back home to Chicago, back in with my parents. I did a little bit of event planning. I went into marketing and what I, when I started reflecting and saying, I'm not, I don't feel like what I value in life is really showing up in my workplace. Right. And I started to do some reflection and I thought I'm doing all these side projects. I helped a lot with, um, creating the team culture, onboarding processes, but these were more side projects. Um, And that led me to this master's degree. So many people were like, hey, look at this program. I think you'll really like it. And I said, no, thank you. I have no interest in pursuing higher education. Like I want to continue just my career path. I thought to me, that was a very huge pivot um, in what I thought what my career trajectory should be. Um, And then I finally, you know, pushed my ego to the side. I looked into the program and I said, this is amazing. I quit my job. I spent two years completely focused in grad school and in the industry and trying to just network and learn and just absorb as much as I can, um, which then led me to finding a career in what I'm doing now. And that happened to be in Brooklyn or in New York. So I moved to Brooklyn. What is your job? So I work for a behavioral change management firm and we partner with companies to help them with their business needs. So my role specifically is a content or I would say insight designer. So we create custom content just based around just large business topics. So this includes inclusion and diversity, um, leadership development, company culture, um, even hiring and onboarding. So we do a lot with just the elements of 
hopefully creating a well-functioning business for the employees. I know Roosevelt's really big on social justice mm. and, and inclusion. How did Roosevelt help you when it comes to incorporating social justice and inclusion in your current role? Yeah, that is a, a really great question. And it's interesting because in those moments, you don't realize the impact events or experiences can have long term. And I think with my time at Roosevelt, there were many moments and even this, I remember because Roosevelt, well, as we all know, is in the city of Chicago. So many things happen. And I remember um, I was part of a sorority and some of my sorority sisters and I jumped into a protest that was that was occurring. And that memory holds so much like like space in my head because I feel like I was, you know, younger at the time. So it didn't really truly like sink in what that, you know, group of people were trying to, you know, speak out against. And I think those memories and the feelings within those experiences kind of help um, push my motivation to hopefully create that on, you know, a grander scale. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I want to learn more how your experiences translated to just every everyday life and the impact that's that's having because you know there's this there's this through line. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to ask you mm-hmm. with that hospitality degree because I know you went right from Roosevelt to Vegas. Mm-hmm. And there may be people who are watching this saying, you know, Irene, I want to go to Vegas. I want to be in hospitality. Um, are you able to speak to what you did? You don't have to speak yeah. you know, about names of businesses unless you want to, but I'm curious to know, like, just what was that path for those who want to explore that same path? Absolutely. Um, so I, when I moved there, um, I, I moved there without a, without a job. Um, and I started just to work at Starbucks, which I love the experience. Of course, it helps build customer service skills. And I ended up very fortunately meeting someone who worked on a um, hotel on the Strip. So they worked at Bally's in Paris, um, if anyone's familiar, in the convention space. So I just asked him, I said, hey, you know, would you like to spend some time chatting? Like, this is what I would like to get into. Um, And we sat down and we talked a little bit and they forwarded my resume along to the director of catering. And I got an interview and um, got hired, fortunately. So really, it was just asking for somebody's time in hopes they will, not in hopes they will give me something, but in hopes they will kind of talk to me and see if I am a good fit in, in their team. So you moved to Vegas not knowing anyone. Yes, correct. And then you just had to get any job because you didn't know anyone. Yeah. So very interesting. So I, um, at, at the time, I knew like someone like far removed. So I had a like an acquaintance. Um, and then when I moved there, I really had to kind of do my own thing. Um, so I reached out to my, this actually links great to Roosevelt. I was part, I'm part of Alpha Gamma Delta, the sorority. So I linked um, up with their alumni group and found someone in Vegas who was like um, part of the sorority at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. They connected me to like a, a apartment to stay into. They connected with um, some of their friends and all that stuff. So it really was, I do think, like a very um, independent experience, though I had potentially different networks to lean, lean on. So it was your relationships from your sorority that. Mm-hmm enabled you to find some connection to actually then find your way. And I see this connection between the activities that you were part of and not being afraid to talk to people, you know, not being afraid to offer and share what you want. Yeah. It's interesting. I will, I will counter that and say, you know, there is fear, right. I think, but it's just the courage to just push through it and talk to people. So I wouldn't say I'm like, um, every time I was like, yes, this would be the most amazing conversation. I kind of had to just push through my own, you know, negative mind chatter and say, just, just see, say hi, see what, see what can come of it. And sometimes it didn't. And then sometimes good things come from it. Yeah. I think that's really scary for a lot of grads, mm-hmm. a lot of undergrads. Um, the idea of actually telling people what you want. Yeah. And you know, knowing what you want too, right. You have to sit and think, what, what do I, what do I want? Yeah. And then communicating that. Yeah. And and it's okay to not know what you want. Yeah. Which I think we've always also established. Um, Elder, you you have a different path. You know, I, I'm also really interested to understand 
I know you you said you started off wanting to be a, a paleontologist, right? Um, That's right. <laughs> right. So, which is which, you know, there's still time. Uh, <laughs> I was absolutely intrigued with it, but I never pursued anything like that. Can you help us to understand that path, especially for international students? You know, the trajectory of a, of a musician is always tough. Um, I started when I was six, and then when I was seven, I won my first national competition in Brazil. And from there on, I was just like, that was my life, just like competing every year, traveling and, and doing all of that, like practicing like crazy. And I decided to come to United States one time that they offered me a grant for a, uh, uh, an exchange program at Marshall University in West Virginia, wow. which was a very interesting time because, it, you know, my English was absolutely horrendous. I mean, it's not good, but at that time it was like really, really tough to go and watch lectures and comment. Um, so the language barrier is absolutely, you know, a problem, but I was very interested in linguistics. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to apply myself. I'm going to learn this as fast as I can. And then the, it was just a six months program. Then I went back to Brazil, finished my, my bachelor's there. And then I decided to come to United States for a master's program. Uh, so it was very expensive. Every all the savings I had didn't, you know, was barely wasn't worth anything here. So I just said, you know what? I I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go crazy. Don't know anyone there, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try it. So I got accepted to uh, to uh, get my master's at James Madison University, and uh, I got there just with my luggage. It's like I have no idea. One week before the class started, it was a last minute decision. I no job, nothing. It was a very short money in my pocket. And I started the program. I received full scholarship, which helped, but I did not foresee uh, the, all the international fees, all the insurance. And I was not expecting, I didn't have knowledge. I didn't understand English that well. Um, so I just like, I spent all my money. Second week at the university, I was uh, assigned with a recital, a very difficult recital with a, a singer in the doctorate program. And nobody wanted to do it. It's like, do you want to do it? It was like, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> so I just like, I, I, I took the chance. I took the risk and I did it. It was not easy. It was extremely, extremely hard. Um, it was it was the time that, you know, running out of money and running out of like energy to just like, you know, and opportunities it was really complicated. But I learned that there are loopholes. I learned that there are ways that you can learn things that you can like navigate. So I think if you ask my advice about an international student, learn how to navigate in a different culture. You know, it's not, you cannot appropriate your culture into someone else's culture. You have to invest in learning about it. And I think I've, I've learned how to navigate in the, the American culture a little bit. And that's why I got out of that, that really hard time in my life. And after I graduated, um, for, with my master's at German, James Master University, I decided to go to a doctor program. And, but at the same time, I didn't want to go to a, any DMA program. So I was like, sort of like, I don't know what to do. And I've heard of Roosevelt University because my former professor there studied at Roosevelt, at CCPA. And he recommended, so editor, that's what I, I think is the fourth uh, oldest conservatory uh, music in, in the country. So there's like a huge tradition. A lot of CSOs, Chicago Symphony Orchestra members, they teach there. So there's a, like a lot of prestige. And I decided. So I turned down the other opportunities for the doctor program to come to Chicago for, for a, a, a non-degree program. There's an artist diploma. But when I moved here, I had in mind what I wanted to do. I, I was already tired of, of education. I've been in schools for 25 years, conservatory, bachelor's, master's. And like going to another degree, I was just like, you know, overwhelmed. And I mean, it's interesting fact, because if had I gone to my DMA program elsewhere, I'll be graduating in May 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. So it would be absolutely hell for me, for an international, you know, uh, uh, to, to go through that. And so when I moved to Chicago, I had in mind, I'm going to select an area that doesn't have Classical music is not as, as prominent. There's a, there is a lot of talent. There's a lot of potential. There is the need that, and then I decided to get this job, a church job in, um, in Berwyn. 
So I was, I'm, I am still the music director at this church, uh, even though I'm not religious, but there's such a nice group of people. And we, I just like brought the idea, hey, if we get a good piano, I can bring all my connections for all, all over the world and I can bring it to Berwyn. And we can provide, you know, concerts. And with the concert series, we create a, uh, a nonprofit organization. We fundraise enough money to open a music academy. There will be a light to a conservatory level program that is very different from all the other schools that are happening in Chicago. Even so, if you are an international student wanting to go to a different country, not only in the United States but anywhere, my advice is be open to absorb the culture. You don't need to give up your own culture. It's not nobody's telling you that, but you have to be able to understand and, and be. You know, I have friends from different countries that came to Brazil to study there and they didn't adapt that well. So it's always like a hard time that you find. But once you figure out the way to navigate through this, uh, I think you find, you know, it's a little more pleasant and you figure out ways to be successful. Yeah. Well, I imagine that there had to be people in certain places that really supported you. And oh, we're- absolutely. Everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. So I would love to, I would love to get a sense of, you know, who are some of the people at Roosevelt University who really supported you, who really had an impact? And, and how did those people help you to get where you are? I mean, the first name would be my mentor, Dr. Ludmila Lazar. Um, she's been working at Roosevelt. Actually, during my time there, uh, we celebrated her 50th um, anniversary at Roosevelt. So she's been working there like for over 50 years now. And she's absolutely incredible. She's like a, this encyclopedia. She knew everyone. She knows everyone. So she was an incredible person to, to help shape my ideas and who I am right now, my, my goals. Um, Dr. Winston Choi was an extreme, like such a wonderful musician, such a wonderful uh, helper. I mean, he's, there's a lot of musicians that they hold back. They don't want to give a lot to students. They just say, that's my limit. And I don't think... Uh, Dr. Choi ever held back at all. He's always like helping students, making sure that they succeed because I think he takes, you know, there's pleasure in helping others succeed. And I think he sees that. And uh, it, and it's, I got to tell, it's rare to find uh, people that are with that same uh, uh, heart that he does. Um, Allegra Montanari, who was the, um, I'm not sure if she's still there, but she used to be the director of the Center for Arts Leadership. Um, there was an incredible program that was that the CCPA, the Chicago College of Performing Arts, created uh, to help students that have vision, that had you know ideas, uh, and help them like not only with the seed grant but also to help them shape. And I was one of them, you know, sitting hours with with uh, Allegra and helping like, hey, I have this idea. How do I do this? What? How do I connect myself? And so she was incredible with this, as well as Dr. Uh, 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 Dana Brown, who is a great friend of mine now. We got like to be very good friends because we share so many things in common. Um, and there are so many, so many folks. There are so many people that that helped me shape this. And uh, when Project 8 started, all the artists that will come to the concert series that would perform, they donated their performance for the fundraising. So all proceeds will go for the Music Academy. That's why we were able to open the Music Academy in three years, which was very incredible. Um, and all the artists, they donated that. And a lot of these musicians were part of, of Chicago uh, College Performing Arts, Roosevelt University. So there, I, I cannot just name one person. There are so many people that helped me get here. Uh, and these are only people from Roosevelt, you know? And I like to say when people say, so you founded Project 88, you the, the one who you just like, yes. I think the social justice starts when we, when I did it becomes we did it because it's a collective, it's a group of people that make something happen. And I think when everyone embraced the goal, the mission, the vision, um, I think that's when uh, we make some difference. But for those who don't know what Project 88 is, I would love for you to briefly just summarize what that is. And then if you can also tie it to how did the how did these, these wonderful people at Roosevelt help you specifically with Project 88? to get it to where it is today. It's called Project 88 because the piano has 88 keys. And the first uh, acquisition, the first uh, 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 you know, 
part of the facility that we had for the creation of Project 88 was a piano. So we started with, with you no, know, we're gonna fundraise money so we can have this instrument here, so we can bring more artists and we can fundraise uh, for the Music Academy. There are so many things happening at the same time. So we have a concert series. We usually have three different concert series. One that was just with the program for kids. One that was a, a Saturday night concert, um, a more you know formal, uh, that is a little more educative as well, like concert etiquette or learning about the, 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 the music or the musicians and have that, that connection is always important for us. Uh, and we had a music festival. So that was the aspect of the performance, of the entertainment. Uh, and as I said before, all these events, they worked as fundraiser for the Music Academy. I've taught like so many schools, both in Brazil, both here and other countries, other cities. And I always found that there is a lack in the, the teaching of uh, the education system for music uh, in the sense that it's too generic and it's too, I don't like to use the word dumbed down, but it's just like everything is simplified because people want to see the results right away. And with Project Music Academy, I when creating the, the curriculum, I decided, no, the students that will be here, they'll have the commitment to participate. They have to go through these several classes in order to, to become a more, you know, wholesome like musician. Um, and doesn't necessarily mean that they have to become a concert pianist or a concert violinist. It doesn't matter what path they follow later, but it's giving them the opportunity to learn more in depth what's to be a musician, what's to make music, and having that relationship with the artists and the, the education portion, that was always uh, our goal. And that's where Roosevelt came along because a lot of these musicians uh, that, that work at Roosevelt, a lot of the professors, the faculty members, they are, uh, a, a lot of them, most of them are mainly uh, concert musicians. They are performers. They're not just like educators. They're not only just like pedagogues, um, and which doesn't mean that they are not, but their main focus is mainly uh, in performance. I think that, that was something that really got my attention when I went to Roosevelt. There were so many good artists, people that like experienced like the best of the best of being a musician, and they're willing to share that with others. And yeah. uh, bringing that to Project 88 was uh, always a differential, you know? Uh, having that to our students to see, I can't believe that I'm watching a concert with this, this guy that was one of the first American to win the Chopin competition. I can't believe that he's here. You know, I mean, I remember when I was younger, I would watch recordings online and I'll get like, I cannot believe that. That, that was an idol for me. I would watch, you know, musicians that caliber. And it was like, I wish I could have, like, I could get close to even talk to them just to see what does it feel like. You know, and now at Project 88, we're, you know, we're able to provide that to the students and it does change lives. It does change like your perspective, what's to make music, what's to absorb, to, you know, to perceive what's going on as a musician. So that's, I don't know if I tie that with Roosevelt, but I think yeah. it's all interconnected. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I bet those kids who are watching these amazing performers, you know, I don't know if they have as deep of an appreciation as you do, oh. but but the fact that this is who they have access to is That's really fair. is really quite remarkable and incredible and exciting. And we'll have a link to Project Eighty Eight, so you know, anybody mm -hmm. else can can check this out. And I know uh, if there's if there's other people, uh, Ellie Dare, who who want to reach out to you, other students or people who are watching this in other countries and other places, are you somebody who is open to having people reach out and ask you questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. I always make my phone number, my email, my personal email and everything available to everyone. Uh, I think networking is extremely important to be, you know, to be a musician. And that's why I was able to bring like people from over 16 countries. I had friends who came to Berwyn from 16 different countries uh, because I established connection with them and they allow me to establish connect connection with them or vice versa. And I think that that relationship is like nurturing that type of relationship is extremely important. So I welcome anyone who wants to reach out to me. There is no like, oh, but I'm not a musician. I don't know, you know, anything. Let's talk about it. I think we got to start somewhere and I'm more than willing to help. Well, you make it very safe and very comfortable for people to reach out. And I get that feeling. Uh, Jordan, when it comes to relationships, I know that you have a really strong relationship with some mentors at Roosevelt and, you know, have really been impacted. I would love to get a, a sense of your experience and just 
how you've been able to benefit from, from those relationships. Mm-hmm. All the professors within the political science department were really great, but specifically uh, Dr. David Ferris. Um, He was really, he was my thesis advisor. Um, He was just, I took every single class that I could of his when I was at Roosevelt. Um, He was someone that really helped me find my voice. I think when I first came into Roosevelt, I struggled to... um, kind of narrate or like write papers in my voice. That was something that I hadn't really had a lot of experience with before. And he was someone that, um, you know, sat me down one day and was like, you have things to say, what you have to say is valuable. Like people want to hear what you have to say. And so he was someone very early on at my time at Roosevelt um, that really, really helped me. And then um, on the other side of it, I also did play basketball at Roosevelt. And so came across a lot of people in the athletic department who um, were really, really helpful to me specifically specifically the athletic director, John. Um, He was there the entire time I was at Roosevelt and he was really just a great resource to have. Um, And then one of my basketball assistant basketball coaches, her name was Ronnie. Um, I'm actually working with her on her startup right now. And so she was just someone that was, again, like I said, like I've said of all of the people at Roosevelt was always there for me, um, encouraged me to be authentically myself and to not care so much what other people thought of me. Can you give me an example of a story or time where one of these people really helped you? Yeah. So my freshman year at Roosevelt um, was really difficult for me. Um, I think it's difficult for a lot of freshmen first time being away from home. Um, I'm not from the Chicago area. And so being in the city was really overwhelming and and navigating all of that. Um, And then on top of that, I was coming in and playing basketball and um, had a relatively successful high school basketball career, but was coming in with a lot of other successful basketball players. And so my freshman year um, did not play, did not really see the court. And so that was something that I really, really struggled with. Um, And I specifically, remember um, Ronnie sitting me down one day and telling me that my time would come and that really what I needed to do was continue working hard, gave me a few specific things I needed to work on, but that my time would come and eventually the next year it did. And so that is something that I I frequently look back on and and really glad that she helped me stick it through because there were times where um, I did think about not continuing to play basketball throughout college. Yeah. It sounds like there was, uh, there there were a bunch of, of bumps in the road. Is there another one with someone else where you shared what was happening and, and they helped you? Because I, you know, I feel like you've got more stories. Yeah, um, I mean, my freshman year, the, if you ask my freshman year roommates, my first six to eight weeks I was there, um, they probably weren't sure if I was even going to continue at Roosevelt. Um, and so I think... I distinctly remember sitting down um, at Dr. Ferris's office hours, one of the first um, first few weeks that I was there and one of the first classes that I took with him and um, really just letting him know, you know, I I'm struggling. I don't know if I fit in at Roosevelt. I don't know if this is the place for me. I don't know if this is the path for me. Um, And really, like I said, he was just someone who encouraged me to be authentically myself and to find things that brought me joy. And so um, from that point on, I really started to find people that I wanted to hang out with or that enjoyed the same things as I did. Um, And like I said, just find things that brought me joy. And and that's something that I I kind of like to live by today is what's going to bring me joy. How am I going to bring joy to others? Yeah. What's your message to those other students who are coming from places where they're not used to being in a big city. You know, it's, it's really new to them. I mean, it sounds like everything really hit you hard and, and you almost didn't make it through. So what advice would you give to them? Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I give um, and I would give to other folks is just talk about it. I don't think I did enough talking to other people my first six to eight weeks that I was there. And I thought that I was the only one that was homesick or that was struggling or that just didn't know um, if Roosevelt was the right fit for me or not. And so I bottled a lot of it up um, and that just caused it to get worse. And so I think the biggest piece of advice I would have for specifically freshmen, you know, transfers, international students, people that are new to Chicago is just talk to other folks. Um, because chances are someone is going through something similar or has gone through something similar um, and they can speak on that and, and help you through it as well. Yeah, that's. I think there's so much power in getting help. Are you Are you a, a first-generation student? No, you're um, not. I, I'm not. First-generation grad student, okay. Because, yes. right, there's, just so, there, there's a lot of new things. I think there's so many first-gen students, especially who just don't realize that they're, they're not alone. Um, oh, there was something I wanted to ask you that was so important. Oh, so when it comes to paying for college, 
was that easy for you? Did you re- were you able to get financial aid? You know, what's your financial story? Yeah, so I got really lucky. Um, I had a really good uh, academic scholarship that Roosevelt offered me. And so that was one of the enticing things to coming to the university was um, the amount they were able to offer me academically. Um, And then a lot of people don't know that Roosevelt is an NAI school, which means they are also able to offer athletic scholarships. And so um, what the academic scholarship wasn't able to cover, most of it was supplemented um, athletically. Um, And then I did come in with some high school scholarships that I had earned as well. Nice. So you you were able to to pretty much pay for college through the scholarships that Roosevelt offered, and and the the scholarships that you were able to find on your own, and the athletic piece too. Mm-hmm. Um, how important was your athletic experience in terms of just your identity, your connection to Roosevelt, your experiences? Yeah, I would say my athletic experience was filled with ups and downs. Um, it was probably playing college basketball was probably the, one of the most difficult things that I've ever done. But I do, looking back on it, um, think that it has helped set me up for success post college. Um, I think like like we were talking about a little bit earlier, like it's easier for me, I think, to adapt or to be flexible or willing to overcome obstacles, just because um, I think that's what college athletics is, is filled with. And also I met some of my best friends through basketball and, and to this day that are, that are still in my life. And so athletics college basketball has definitely played a huge part um, in my journey at Roosevelt. And it's something I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know Roosevelt if I hadn't been recruited to play basketball there. I hadn't known about Roosevelt prior to that. And so really just super grateful to the coaches who started that for me. Yeah. So they wanted you and then you got there and you didn't get to play. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's college athletics for you. A lot of freshmen go through the same thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really hard thing. I think it's really important for anybody who's watching this to understand that when you are a first year student and you are a first year athlete on a team with experienced athletes, that, that might happen, right? Like that's normal. Yeah, I, it's it's super normal. I think a lot of people, like I said, you're coming um, from a high school being a really talented player, but so are the 17 other girls that are on the team. And so you really have to keep that in mind, um, which is hard for an 18, 19 year old kid to do, but um, your time will come. Be patient. Keep working. Yeah. Oh, that's that's I wish we had more time because I I would just love to dig into like the attitude. I, I just ask you, did you have an attitude where you like pissed off? You know, did you have a chip on your shoulder? I did. Um, My freshman year, I remember, you know, sitting the bench one game that it was a really close game we lost. And I told myself, you know, I will never sit the bench again. I will never do this again. And so I really had a chip on my shoulder going into that summer, um, worked really hard. And then come my sophomore season was the first or second person off the bench. And so was a huge, huge chip on my shoulder. And senior year, did you play? Yes. Were you a starter senior year? Um, on and off, it was kind of weird. Um, we had a new coach and only had about 10 girls my last year there. So it was kind of new. Hey, Ellie Dare, I have a quick question for you. Uh, are you able to admit that you're really good and talented uh, when it comes to being a pianist? No, I just want to, I'm not able (laughs) to, I've seen this the best of the best, man. They they don't talk about how good they are. Just, they, they don't admit it. It's it's a, it's but it's a, it's just a subjective thing, you know. It's just like what is good. I mean, we can start with that conversation. What is good? I can play fast notes. I can play multiple notes. I can memorize two hours of music. But what is good? I'm not the best. There are so many people that can do better than I do. So, you know, I try my best. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. I like that, Irene. I want to know of your Roosevelt experience. If there was a class or a person who really impacted you and helped you and continues to be in your corner, you know, the specifics, that story is always really helpful. Yeah. um, That's a really good question. Unfortunately, this may bring a little somber, a somber vibe to the conversation, but um, there was a professor, uh, Professor Carol Brown, who is no longer physically present here with us, but she was the most amazing professor in that whole um, program. In my unbiased opinion, she just brought so much energy and joy and really just goodness to the class. And I think there was one in particular where all the students had the opportunity to all semester long create a project. So we, we kind of did like a mock 
as if we were a business, right? So we created a product, we planned an event, and at that event, we sold this product for, um, and we raised money for for um, a nonprofit. And I just remember those were just some of the funniest experiences because sometimes I think you know you go to class, you're like, all right, I'll show up and then I'll leave. But those memories, I think, are just. This brings so much joy because it just brought not only the education piece, but the ability to have fun while you're learning and really just doing, I think it brings in um, the the social justice piece where you're also helping others along the way, right? It's not just for your own learning, but you're also able to give back with that, um, with raising funds. So I think that particular class and professor really, um, really holds uh, a lot of, a lot of my heart. Yeah. That's that's wonderful that she's still with you, and you know, it did it it wasn't somber. It was actually kind of joyful. Oh, I mean, I don't no, want to. Yeah. I, mean, I think feeling feeling the the energy and presence of a of a professor who had an impact, who still is having an impact, is is really inspiring and and wonderful in, in so many ways. Grant, I would love to know about your experience. Is is there a particular teacher, a class, an experience that you had at Roosevelt that you, you you think about or you carry with you? Mine's a course. I took a mathematical modeling course. I think it was, so I was going for education um, and, and math. I'm pretty sure it was an elective. I don't think it was something that you know everybody took. Uh, and it was really the, the philosophy and, and kind of the building blocks of how how math work, applied math works, which, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's something that most people think about every day. But as I've moved into, you know, marketing and, and looking at ad performance, you know, having that deeper understanding of, of math and, and why you're doing, you know, why these graphs work, not just use this graph, but here's, here's kind of, here's, here's the foundation of it. Um, has really been important. And I think this, this speaks to, to the beauty of a, a liberal education where you, can, where you can take a course that you know, isn't exactly what you want to do when you grow up and, and you can learn so much almost on accident. So at the time when you were taking that class, did you have an appreciation of it? No, I thought it was really frustrating. I thought it was neat, but it was also really frustrating. Yeah. Right. Do you remember your grade? I think I got an A. Oh, you do? You got a lot yeah. of A's, huh? I mean, I did okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, it's nice to hear because a lot of times people take classes and they're like, when am I ever going to need this in life? Right. And basically it's, you know, you don't know, you might actually need this in life. And this class actually helped you. Uh, yeah. When when uh, it comes to choosing, when you when you chose to go to Roosevelt, Grant, why, why was that the decision you made? Location was really important to me. I, um, I was currently working, so I needed to be in a certain place. Uh, so that was a big one. Uh, I really like the the idea of Roosevelt. You know, social justice is is really in, important to me. Um, just to, to stick on that point, one of the the really fun or not fun, but but interesting things about about uh, my career trajectory. Um, right now, we're a crowdsourcing company. I work at a crowdsourcing company and it really embodies the ideas of inclusivity. You know, it's about bringing lots of people together. Um, it's about, you know, the, the, one of the core premises is when you bring lots of people together with a lot of diverse ideas, you're going to get really neat results that you're never going to get if you have three people with the same background in the same room. Um, so, so that has, you know, that, that social justice diversity, uh, that's, that's really important and, and has become a, a part of, um, you know, my, my life and, and what I'm doing right now. Was that something you were seeking or was that just something that turned out to be another added extra on top of the math course? I don't have any like epiphany moment. I had to choose Roosevelt because of this, uh, but I think it all, all came together with, with, with a great experience. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about interviewing because I know that there's a lot of, of grads and people who are going to be looking at this, seniors, people are going to be making those changes. Um, Irini, I know that you went far away from home. You're in a new place. You've, you've done this a couple of times. So when it comes to interviewing, when it comes to um, preparing for that, do you have any suggestions or advice on what someone can do uh, to help prepare for a high stakes conversation? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the first um, piece of advice I would give is to practice. Um, a lot of the times it could be unnatural to, to answer questions in a traditional interview setting. So definitely practice. Um, hit the key points. Like what, what is your differentiation factors? What makes you unique? And how can you bring that into the conversation? Um, I think is very critical. Um, definitely lean on your personality to lean on what you think, um, what, what comes naturally to you. I think a lot of the time we try and um, mold into what they expect us to be. Um, but really when you just are your unique self, you feel more comfortable and you're able to answer questions more um, fluidly. And definitely do a little research, see what the company's about, see if their values align with yours, really take note of some personal stories or experiences you can bring. And um, don't be afraid to ask them questions too, right? Because it's a two-way, it is a two-way conversation. So if you want to learn more about a specific area or a specific um, team or just kind of what the company's doing, go ahead and ask them. I think they'll definitely find that um, approach very, um, they'll, they'll see it in a high, high regard. Have you ever applied for a position and not gotten it <laughs> and been upset? <laughs> Of course, I used to have a, like an Excel spreadsheet and then it got to like 150 jobs I applied to. And I was like, you know what? This is actually a downer. I don't need this energy in my life. So I kind of stopped doing that. But of course, there were there were certainly roles where I was like, this this is going to be it. I feel it in my bones like this is for me. And unfortunately, it was not for them. Um, so that was a huge reality check. And you kind of have to uh, rebuild your self-esteem and say, hey, you know, that's OK. Something else will come come my way. And and then it does, it falls in line in the moment. It's very, it's very difficult, but I think, um, I think Jordan may have mentioned this, but just go out, just talk to people about it. Right. It's okay to be frustrated. Ask someone who, you know, who will build your self-esteem back up and say, you're great. You will get it. Just, just keep going. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. Grant, I know that you are, are part of the startup now, which is really exciting. Um, yeah. Chicago has a really vibrant startup community. And I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. And, uh, you know, I would, I would love for you to be able to offer a little insight into just how you decided to work at your current job and just can I, be here. Can I, can I jump in on the interview one? I have oh my gosh, I want more. I would love, yeah, like, yeah, yeah that's, I really also like you, you've had a lot of those. Yes, please, Grant. Oh, I have, I had a, I, I also do a lot of interviewing and I think there's, uh, Irene, you, I think you mentioned both of these, but just to, to bring them out. Um, what most people don't think about is you're interviewing for a specific company in a specific position. So do as much research as you possibly can. Probably the most impressive thing that, that I've ever seen in an interview is somebody who really understands the company that they're coming to. You know, when they come back and they said, okay, I read this PR piece about you guys. I understand your culture. I've been watching your social media. You will immediately and, and significantly stand out not just coming and saying, I did this and I did that and I did this. And, and asking the good questions is another thing that, that just immediately will, will stand out. You know, don't passively just say, I'm, I'm going to answer these pushback. What, what a lot of people don't know about in, interviewing, and I don't know, maybe other people can jump in, but what I've found is, is most people being interviewed think that there's tons of candidates and you're going to be lucky if you get a job. And the reality of, 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 of life is there's actually more limit to the number of candidates than than you know companies probably want you to 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 realize. You know, typically they're working really hard to get good people. So, um, you know, if you come with the right mindset that I'm going to understand the company, um, I'm going to find a job that fits me. I I would have so much respect for somebody who came in to an interview, talked, and said, you know, this isn't for me. You know, this I don't think this is a good fit. And then they went to another interview and said, you know, this is a really good fit. I like the company culture. I like the leadership, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's great. Well, anybody who is interviewing with you now has this, this cookie, yeah. you know, this thing, I, this is going to be out there. So basically yeah. you have, yeah, you have secret. oh, right. You said like, if someone's like, Hey Grant, I watched that conversation Oh man, with Roosevelt. That's a good thing. Hired. Right? Yeah. They would be hired. Yeah. Right. You're like, you're right. This is it, man. This is the back door. This is the, the secret door, whatever it is. Uh, that's, that's exciting. I'm glad you put that out there. Cause I like, I like to do that. I think that's, that's actually one of the things if I'm interviewing 
and I'm talking to someone, I want to learn, you know, like, like even all of you during this conversation, I mean, I'm not looking for a job, but what I'm looking for is the story. And I think that whenever you are presenting yourself and interested in spending most of your week working and contributing to something, you should know the story. And, and, and the only way to do that is to do that research. And, and it is, it is super impressive, uh, you know, to, to be able to do that. Uh, Ellie Dare, what about you? I know you, you hire people, you also have interviewed, you've had a lot of auditions. You know, I'm really curious about that audition piece. Yeah. Like, how do you prep for a high stakes? And I say high stakes, I don't think anything is really that high stakes, but how do you prepare for those moments of judgment when you are auditioning and trying out and wanting to be accepted? Well, I mean, the, it's different worlds. Like the interview portion of it, as well as the uh, the audition part, they are very they're completely different in a sense that one may be a little more objective than the other. Uh, one allow a little more authentic you know, you to be more authentic than the other one, both has the layer of authenticity, you know, you have that, that opportunity, but the audition, you have to provide your signature. I mean, one, someone audition for me, or when I was audition, one of the things that I've heard the, the most is like, you cannot try to imitate anyone. You have to be yourself. Um, and that portion was like, so I always, when I was practicing and preparing for this, I was like, how can I, match the standards they're given because there are standards but at the same time show who i am what is who is elder on stage who, who's that guy and i think that the, it was always a struggle to do that but i think you know once you do that many times you get you sort of get used and i don't think i audition enough in my life i have friends that they audition for orchestra jobs and it's just like every month they have like three auditions. So they are, it's a, it's a part-time job for them. Let me ask you this. Cause you're in, you're, yes. you've got the piano here. Do you remember something that you've auditioned with? Like, do you still have it in your brain of, of a piece that you used to audition? Uh, yes, I have some pieces that I remember, but I remember when I auditioned uh, at Roosevelt at, at Chicago college performing arts, uh, it was the last audition of that season for me so I was like traveling the entire country and performing and auditioning so I was exhausted and I got to to Guns Hall at Roosevelt that is like this gorgeous hall and with a beautiful piano but the piano was um, on a dolly so they would facilitate you move it around which was a little bit higher than I expect so the pedal was higher and I was not expecting to have to do that. So you have to, you, the level of, of the adaptability that you have to provide at that moment is incredible. So it's the pressure. You have like that panel of like eight incredible professions that like, the, you know, they won competition, they traveled the entire world and they're analyzing your performance. And I was there not dealing with myself. I was dealing with the piano. <laughs> so it was a very interesting uh, uh, moment. And I just sat at the piano. I, when I noticed that, it was like, all right, put yourself together. Well, how can you do it? And then I tried to face the problem. There was another occasion that I was performing uh, in a concert uh, in Richmond, Virginia, and the piano was missing some keys. It was like a different version of piano that does not have 88 keys. And most of the repertoire that I was providing demanded all 88 keys. So on the spot, I have to just like improvise and try to figure out because I only had 15 minutes to to test out the piano. So you have to be extremely uh, uh, flexible. And so my advice for anyone who is going to an audition is practice your flexibility, pra practice the, you know, to, to have like a, a, an, a, an understanding that is elastic, that is, that is uh, uh, malleable when you on stage, because you're not only dealing with your uh, uh, emotions, you're dealing with the actual, the physical environment there. Uh, yeah. So that was one aspect. But the interviewing aspect of that, I agree with both both uh, Grant and uh, Irene, that um, you have to be prepared. You have to know to whom you're applying to. You have to be on par with their mission, with their uh, the, their environment. My problem when people come to uh, to interview uh, to be interviewed by me is when they come with that prompt, that's that script that is extremely like mechanical. And I don't get to see who that person is, you know? So yeah. I much rather like be alert of all the changes on this, with the stage light, 
be flexible because you know you don't know the questions. Could be that like an interviewer is going to ask like something extremely personal that you don't feel comfortable talking about. How do you dodge that? Be flexible. Practice, as Irene said. You know, learn about the the, the institution where you're applying to because. If you're not aware of their mission and you say something that does not align with their mission, you lost a job. In the same way, I mean, maybe not knowing that, you don't want that job. Yeah. So I think there's so many, you have to have a broader perspective of, on what you're doing, not simply just like jump in. I'm gonna try a thousand different interviews and get it. No, choose wisely. I ask you a favor. Um, I see that there's, you know, there's music on your piano. Um, can you just play what's on the page? Just just that one page. Can you do that just so we can see you play? <laughs> so it's a bunch of cool stuff. <laughs> I I don't know if the microphone is going to help you. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's fuzzy, but let's see. The audio is probably like cutting. No, that was beautiful. You know, you. I have to tell you, all I want to do is hear more. And <laughs> you know, even in that short, that that short piece, um, you know, you you play with a with an energy and a and a passion and a flow. It just it's it feels like uh, it feels like life, you know, as opposed to just just uh, music. I don't know if anyone else picked up on that, but uh, <laughs> there was something quite beautiful about that. So thank you for. Thank you for doing that. Um, it's very kind of you. Uh, I, I, I couldn't help myself. I was like the whole time, I was like, I just want to see him play it while we're here. I was secretly wishing that's what you were going to ask. So I <laughs> yeah. appreciate you asking that. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was trying to get there. Uh, Jordan, when it comes to interviewing and when it comes to going to grad school and, and, and going that path, um, do you have any insight or advice for someone who's considering pursuing a graduate degree? Yeah, I think going through the process myself, um, and I think some folks touched on this already, but um, while you're the person being interviewed, you're also interviewing whoever is interviewing you to see if it's a good fit. And so as I was kind of figuring out um, whether or not Lewis, where I'm currently at, was the right grad school fit for me, I I came in with a lot of questions that I had about um, specific things that I had seen on their website or specific things that I knew that I needed in a grad school education or what I needed as a grad assistant coach. And so um, really my advice to people that are either considering pursuing graduate school or going through the interview process is like, don't don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. And if it's not a good fit, um, like Grant said, it's not a good fit for you um, and you'll find the fit for you. And so don't feel pressure to take the first job offer that you might get um, if you don't feel like it's the right fit for you or don't be uh, feel pressured to accept the first graduate school that sends you an offer because if you don't feel like it's a good fit, chances are it's not a good fit for you and that fit is still is still coming. And then paying for grad school, is that something that's difficult? Do they offer grants, scholarships, things of that nature? Yeah, actually, as a grad assistant coach, um, I have my grad school paid for, which is really nice. Um, there's also a bunch of um, grad assistant positions you can get within colleges or a TA position. And so there's a lot of different avenues um, that you can get your grad school paid for. Also, um, you know, traditional scholarships and things like that are also available to you. But really, um, I have a friend who is an admissions advisor at UIC, and he has his grad school paid for. So there's a lot of different um, and unique avenues you can go um, go through to get your grad school paid for. Going from Roosevelt to grad school, did you get some guidance and support when it came to the application process and, and, and navigating that next step from Roosevelt? Yeah, actually, um, my professor, Dr. David Ferris, was one of the people that wrote me one of the recommendation letters that got me into um, the School of Business at Lewis. And so honestly, my Roosevelt professors have been really great. Any any different point of my career that I've been at within the last few years, um, I've always been able to come back to them and just see, seek out their advice. And, and they've helped me um, and guide me into you know where I, where I am now. So you're still in touch with your Roosevelt? professors? Yes, I am. Doctor, is it Dr. Ferris? Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, so you communicate with him frequently? 
Yes, we are. I would, I would consider him a friend um, at this point, And I, I would hope he would consider me the same, but we are, we are close still. He saved you. He did. He did. He might not know it. Um, I've told him a few, few times and he might think I'm exaggerating, but he really did. So what was the magic? So like, if there's other, other faculty or counselors, advisors, coaches, like what did Dr. Ferris say? Like, or what did he communicate that really helped you? Cause it sounded like you were, you were really close to, to the exit. Yeah. I mean, I think what set him apart was he was just very authentic with me. He was himself. Um, and so he didn't sugarcoat it. He, he told me, you know, there's going to be times where it's not easy and there's going to be times where, um, you know, you feel like you can't go any longer or this isn't the right fit for you. And he's like, you really have to dig deep and, and look within yourself and figure out what's best for you. And so he never put any pressure on me, never told me what the right decision was that he always left that up to me, but he created that space where I felt comfortable to explore that or to have those conversations with him. And I think, um, by him being, you know, vulnerable and being his authentic self helps me be my authentic self. Yeah. I don't think people realize how difficult change is and, and, and the unknown, and especially when you're 18, 19, going through those changes, I think throughout our lives, I mean, it's, it's really brutally hard. And I, I spend a lot of time, helping people to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And you know what I'm, what I'm feeling is your experience at Roosevelt really helped you to get comfortable with uncomfortable experiences and navigate change. And um, I would love to wrap this up. I've got two more questions for you, but I want to know why you're here, why you are willing to take time out of your lives. I mean, we've been here for a good amount of time. Your time's incredibly valuable, but why is it that you decided to be here and why is Roosevelt an important part of your life? And Jordan, since we were talking, you know, if you want to answer that, I'd love that. Yeah, um, I decided to come on here today because I truly would not be the person I am today without my time at Roosevelt. And so um, if I could talk to or reach someone who is in those beginning stages and, and struggling their freshman year or, or being a new student, um, I, I want to tell them that it does get better and that um, really just reach out to the people on campus, reach out to your professors, join some organizations. Um, there are people at Roosevelt that are willing to help you. Um, they helped me. And so I came here today just to, to share my love for the university and just my appreciation for all those folks that helped me get through those first six to eight weeks where I, I really thought I was going to drop out of college and move back home. And so just to express my gratitude, my appreciation, and, and to tell folks that might be going through similar things that it does get better um, and just talk about it, let people know where you're at and, and make sure that you are doing what's best for you. Oh, you're the best. Jordan, that's, it's so meaningful when people hear that. I mean, it really is just so incredibly meaningful. So thanks for being so generous. Grant, I'm curious to know why did you decide to be here and, and take time out of your incredibly busy um, life to share? Yeah. Um, so this is how I was raised. My father was an attorney and throughout my life when I was young and until today, I, I think he's always had a group that he, he volunteered for. Um, he, he worked for a children's museum for some time. There was a, um, the uh, Elmhurst Symphony Orchestra. Maybe you know that group. Um, I think he, he was their, their legal counsel. Uh, so I think, you know, I was oh, raised world. that it was important. Yeah. <laughs> that it was important to, to, to give back and, and find an organization to, to, to continue, you know, somebody who, who helped you and you want to, you know, give, give what you've learned back to them and, and, and spread spread the love i guess yeah thanks for giving us access to you and for anybody who has questions about any of the things we've discussed i know everybody here mm -hmm. is accessible and, and and wants to answer questions right you're, you're included in that right grant absolutely yeah yeah that's, that's wonderful irene i would love to know you know you're 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 in eastern time you know it's even later where you are right now and yeah. uh, you're very generous and I'd love to know, you know, why, why did you take time out of your, out of your busy, busy, why did you take time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight? Yeah, I feel like I, I'm literally usually dreaming at this point. I should be in bed, but I think, you know, not to reiterate what my, um, Grant and Jordan have said, but I do find it important to kind of just help where you can. And I think, you know, a few hours of my time to help alleviate some stressors or fears that, you know, somebody who's, 
starting their college career um, may have, I feel like that's, that is something that I am more than happy to do and kind of continue that conversation even after this. Um, selfishly, I also found it very um, just curious as to what other alumni are up to. I feel like, you know, I would never have learned even a half of what I learned about how to become a concert pianist without this conversation. So just even learning about others and where they have ended up and how, you know, Roosevelt has helped them um, throughout their lives. I feel like selfishly, that was also um, very rewarding to be a part of. Yeah. Well, that's, it's really fun to see just the different paths. And it's also fun for other people to imagine. I mean, there's just four of you here, Mm. but there are thousands upon thousands of grads who have connection and would be willing to talk to Roosevelt students. You know, being part of that community is really powerful. Mm. And exactly what you're saying, Irene, it's like, it's really cool. It's interesting. I love that. Like, this is, this is so fun. I love Mm. it. So let's see, who do I have left? Eladair. (laughs) <laughs> it's you. I knew, I knew you were here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it sounds cheesy, though, but I mean, giving back to the community, you know, it's such a, a phrase that is used so, so often, but uh, it, it does resonate with me because I, my career uh, started from a community that was similar to Project 88. They offer like full scholarship to students that could not afford. And, you know, that idea that they are investing in me to be to become potentially become who I became, um, it's extremely important, and that was instilled in my in my career, in my in my personal life as well. So being here today, I think there was an opportunity to share that with other people, to share what was my trajectory, what you know, to make myself available for people that they're interested in going through this, and I, I, I am part of this group of friends that now is scattered around the world that we call the, the diapason effect. The diap- diapason or diapason is a pitchfork. So the fact is that if you place the pitchfork, if you ring and place it on a, on a violin and place another violin on the side, if they are in the same frequency, they're gonna resonate, they're gonna vibrate, even though you didn't touch the other violin. So this violin here is completely, you know, it's not knowing the fact that it can cause to other people, but if you are in a good, in a good place that you can share some of these ideas, some of your successes, or even some of the bruises, <laughs> you know, I think it does resonate with other people that are going through the same path. And uh, I appreciate you offering that opportunity to us, you know, to share our experience here, as well for others that are, that are out there looking for this type of experience or hearing more like what is to be a pianist, what is to be, you know, a, you know, all these jobs that we have there. You know, and all the incredible uh, alumni that we have here tonight, I think it's very diverse. And I think there are people that they might be a concert pianist, but they want to go through a different route in their life. And they learn from not from me, but learn from someone else here tonight. So I think that opportunity is extremely important, not for us. I think we all have the, the common understanding that it's not about ourselves here, but it's what we can offer because we're perpetrating, we are making it uh, accessible to others out there. Yeah. And, and I feel that and your generosity and willingness and openness is something that really is, um, it, it's really wonderful. And, and I hope others who are watching this and participating in this can pick up on. And I know all of you have made it clear that you're available if, if people have questions uh, regarding anything that we discussed or anything else that they might learn. And for those of you who are interviewing with Grant, uh, you have a much better chance of getting the job now, right? I mean, like you, 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 you found it, so you know you might as well share we're, it. We're right? we're hiring, just just. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. I'll spread the word. I'll, I'll 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 share I'll share that, and 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 hopefully we'll all be connected on LinkedIn. Um, if I can be a resource in any way, uh, I I truly am am humbled and grateful to have the opportunity to visit with all of you. It's you know one of the benefits of what I get to do is I get to, I get to um form these relationships with, with really uh, incredibly interesting dynamic people. So if I can help in any way and serve, you know, I genuinely mean that. And um, yeah, I'd love to be a resource. And for anybody who's watching, you know, the offer stands for you as well. Anything I can do, anything any of us can do. We're really grateful for that. I'm going to close this out. I always give everyone an opportunity to clarify something, to share something. I don't know if there's something else where you're like, Harlan, I really wanted to communicate that, but I didn't have a chance. So I give you that opportunity. Does anybody else have anything they wanted to share? I have one thing that I was wondering. Uh, 
Um, a lot of people ask me about what is to be international student in the United States. How do you afford it? You know, um, how, what is the process? Uh, and some folks, I mean, some Americans, they might not understand the struggles of like being international students. Sometimes not only some fees are higher, some insurance companies that, that they exhort, you know, there's more fees add up to it. But one of the aspects that a lot of people ask, like, can you take out a loan, a student loan? And as an international student, I am at least, I'm not aware, uh, but as far as I know, you're not allowed to take out loans. So how do you afford it? So for whoever is an international student who's planning to apply, you have to narrow down your options to the opportunities, to the universities that they're offering grants, they're offering scholarships, they're offering GAs and everything like that. So um, I just wanna share this with people that they might be willing. So can you take out loans? Can you, uh, how do you get scholarships? So, call the, the, the admissions office, call the, the person that you have in contact with the university and ask about that. Don't be shy. There is no shaming as like, hey, I cannot afford this. Can I, do you guys have some, some uh, financial opportunities for international students? And you'll be surprised, you know, how, you know, that the opportunity is just like sometimes it's hiding over there. Yeah. So I just want to share that with some folks. That might be that's, interesting. That's wonderful. And I'd like to add to that to find the clubs, the organizations where international students are actively leading and participating in, because those international groups and organizations, you can reach out to those students who are on the campus who have figured out how to get there, and they might have an even more direct path to help you to figure that out so that you can get there as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. And every university, I mean, as far as I know, they have an international department um, and they always try to gather new people. And I, I got to meet when I moved to the United States, I got to meet a lot of people from the international department. And it, you get to know from experience. It's word of mouth. You know, you get to learn from others experience. It's, you know, so don't be shy. Ask, ask people. Yeah. Well, you know how to dream. You know, you're 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 living a very unusual life that, <laughs> that many people would like to live. And it's only a result of continuing to put yourself out there and never, and never stopping this belief that anything's possible. We started with the word vulnerability. And I always, I use this, 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 this story quite a bit. I, it's not mine. I'm not quoting myself, but I heard it. I don't know where, uh, about the, the lobster. The lobster does not grow if they don't shed their, their shell and they become vulnerable for another shell that is a little bit larger to grow. So that transition of becoming vulnerable is extremely important for growth. And um, I took that, you know, almost literally, I am always willing to be vulnerable because that's making me grow. And it's not comfortable, it's never comfortable, but I'm sure that I'm growing that somehow. So I think we started that conversation with vulnerability and it, that keep like, you know, <laughs> poking my head. Yeah. And I think a great way to wrap this up and to connect this to the bigger theme is uh, at, Roosevelt, at Roosevelt University, you know, you have your people, you have your places. So when you are navigating these changes and it is uncomfortable, you can be supported and you can find community which is something that really helps to navigate those changes. So I'm really grateful to be part of this community, to be able to share this community. And I look forward to continuing this conversation. And for everybody who has been with us this evening, I'm Harlan Cohn. This has been a career conversation with Roosevelt University grads, and I'm grateful to be in your corner and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, everybody. And thanks everybody for, for watching. Thanks.